Hello, friends. Today, we're continuing our journey through the book of Acts. And I'll be reading to you from Acts chapter 20, verse 17 through 37, from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. It says, From Miletus, he sent a message to Ephesus, asking the elders of the church to meet him. When they came to him, he said to them, You yourselves know how I lived among you the entire time, from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears, enduring the trials that came to me through the plots of the Jews. I did not shrink from doing anything helpful, proclaiming the message to you and teaching you publicly and from house to house as I testify to both Jews and Greeks about repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, as a captive to the Spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and persecutions are waiting for me. But I do not count my life of any value to myself. If only I may finish my course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus, to testify to the good news of God's grace. And now I know that none of you, among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom, will ever see my face again. Therefore, I declare to you this day, that I am not responsible for the blood of any of you. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Keep watch over yourselves and over all the flock, of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, that he obtained with his own blood of his Son. I know that after I have gone, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Some even from your own group will come distorting the truth in order to entice the disciples to follow them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years, I did not cease night or day to warn everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the message of God's grace, a message that is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold or clothing. You know for yourselves that I worked with my own hands to support myself and my companions. In all this, I have given you an example that by such work, we must support the weak. Remembering the words of the Lord Jesus, for he himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. When he had finished speaking, he knelt down with them all and prayed. There was much weeping among them. They embraced Paul and kissed him, grieving especially because of what he had said, that they would not see him again. Then they brought him to the ship. Acts chapter 20 contains some of the most passionate words recorded from Paul in the New Testament. Verse 17 through 37 is Paul's farewell speech, which was no doubt charged with emotion. Paul had done significant mission and ministry in Asia Minor, which included the cities of Ephesus, Philippi, Thessalonica, and many others. But now he is preparing to move on. His time with them has come to an end. Paul begins his speech by recalling to the elders of the church all the things he did, but also the way he did them. He uses terms like serving the Lord with humility, enduring trials even though there were plots against him, teaching from house to house, testifying to both Jews and Gentiles. And he says he does not count his life as any value to himself, only to God 
and the ministry. But in verse 25, he says, you will never see my face again. Imagine for a minute having to say goodbye to someone you've come to love and respect, your mentor, teacher, and friend. Now imagine that you'll never see that person's face again. Paul had built relationships with his fellow men and women and had walked with them through their life's challenges. But in a classic Pauline way, he does not end the speech there. He doesn't say, you'll never see my face again and then goodbye. He instead goes into teacher and pastor mode. Still in a frame of emotion, he says to them, keep watch over yourselves and your congregations because savage wolves will come. Some people might even distort the truth and teach you wrong things. He also says to them that he didn't seek any reward for what he did. He didn't seek gold, silver, or clothing and that there was pain and suffering involved in the work and the mission. The speech ends with a very moving act from Paul, very reflective of Jesus Christ and the Garden of Gethsemane. Paul knelt and prayed with them. Then he embraced his friends, and they cried and grieved that they would never see his face again. Paul would not return to them since he was setting off to Rome to begin his ministry there. But it's essential for us to understand that even though Paul was leaving Asia Minor, which by the way is modern day Turkey, the work he started will continue because he had equipped the elders and the congregations. No doubt the people would have been questioning their own ability. They saw Paul do the work and he was gifted and he was talented. So they may have felt like they couldn't live up to his standard. But that's not what they were expected to do. They were not expected to be clones of Paul. Paul was not perfect. He did his very best with passion and eagerness. And this is the advice that he leaves the people. He says, keep watch over yourselves and your congregations because savage wolves will come. Some people might even distort the truth and teach wrong things to you. He also says to them that he didn't seek any reward for what he did and that there was pain and suffering involved in the work. To paraphrase, he tells them, don't be influenced by others, but stay true to what you know is the truth. In a roundabout way, he tells them, don't seek reward for their work, no payment of any kind. And finally, the work would be hard and that there would be pain and suffering. He now wanted them to be who they were. They each had their own ability and would bring something different to the people they served, adding to the richness of the experience. All the while, Paul will be their inspiration for doing the work of God. As I prepared this message and reflected on all the work of Paul, I couldn't help but think about the immensity of Paul's influence. Don't get me wrong, there is some controversy over his work and some of the things he said has implications for race and gender equality. Yet, he has influenced a great deal of the church and her teachings. This made me think about the people that influence us. You and me. Some of the most influential spiritual people in the past 20 years have been the Dalai Lama, 
Desmond Tutu, and Eka Toll. But we're also inspired by artists, leaders, actors, authors, scientists, geniuses, and athletes. Isha Judd, an author and speaker, says, Anyone who challenges the limits of human capacity can capture our attention and evoke wonderment in our imagination. They make us feel that the possibilities are endless, that the limits we have placed upon ourselves can also be surmounted. One thing that fascinates me is just how many of the individuals who have captured the attention of the world have gone through so much in their own lives and have done so against all odds. It's wonderful if we've been inspired by these well-known people, but think for a moment about the people or person who inspired you to do good and to change the world for the better. The person or people who spoke life-changing and life-giving words to you, helping you get through the toughest time of your life. The person who helped you quit smoking because it's not good for your health or drinking alcohol because it made you into the worst version of yourself. Who has made you Put down that bottle. What about that person who saw that you had potential and they affirmed you and you started seeing yourself as more worthy? So today, as you consider who you are and who you want to be, choose the best version of yourself. Forget about all the bad lessons you've learned along the way, the lessons which drive a wedge between you and your fellow human beings. And remember the lessons which affirm others, the ones you were taught to value others, even if you don't understand them. This is what makes God pleased with us. Not our achievements or our milestones, but when we love, respect, and care for one another. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord abides forever. Have a blessed and wonderful day. Goodbye for now.